First of all, thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for uh, holding this whole very chaotic thing together. It's really <laughs> quite quite impressive. Um, I guess that uh, as I was witnessing uh, this afternoon, the, the thing that occurred to me is fairly obvious that what we are involved with here is is a culture change, and I think I. I think it's fair to say I'm the oldest doctor in the room, even compared to you, Arthur. Uh, not by much. Not by much, but still. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think back on my own uh, medical education and in residency training, the culture was very, very different than what it is now, very different. And it, not to be overly simplistic, but I think what we've witnessed over the past several decades is the the effect of, first of all, of the technology, of the seductiveness of the technology and the wonderful, wonderful things that, that can be done now for patients, uh, uh, for their health and for their well-being. That's just, just miraculous. There's no question about it. And it's been enormously seductive, enormously attractive to think about those things as being what medicine is about. The other the theme that is another f factor that's been so uh, prominent is money. In, in the profession, the fact that that not only in terms of the cost of health care, but the way in which physicians are being impacted by the financial considerations uh, that they're dealing with. And I think these two factors have tended to deviate the culture of our profession away from patients. And I think what we're about and what everything that happened this afternoon and what the Buxbaum Institute is clearly primarily committed to is to refocus our profession on what it really is fundamentally responsible for, and that is for the well-being of our patients. And every discussion today was was emblematic of the fact that, that you're focusing on the communication between the doctor and patient, things that go on in that setting that determines the quality of that doctor-patient interaction. And to my view, I think unless we can get the culture reoriented in that direction and with efforts such as what's happening here, I think the profession is going to lose its public purpose, its trust with the public. I think we have to emphasize this aspect of the culture and it's going to take time. I think Wendy pointed out in her talk also a cultural uh, change that it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take many, many different kinds of efforts. I mean, cultural change is probably among the hardest thing that any of us can be involved with, and, but I think it's also fundamentally important and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and I just can't tell you how pleased I am to, to witness what's going on here at the University of Chicago with the Buxbaum Institute and, and other efforts that you're doing. I think you really are leading the way in terms of, of, of emphasizing and focusing explicit attention to this critical issue, so thank you. So as the second oldest, Jordan, I'll make a few comments. Uh, I too want to congratulate the Institute and Mark and Holly and Matt. And it's really uh, wonderful to see this uh, program developed here. And it already has national uh, visibility and uh, effect. Uh, there are two things I'd like to mention. One is the same as Jordan's, but the thing that always impresses me is the students come to Madison, and we heard a lot of them here today, with such uh, beautiful ethics and such uh, ambitions to do the right thing. Uh, and really, uh, in many ways, the cream of the crop of graduating students from college uh, still come and do medicine. And it's really gratifying to see that and to see it played out here in the presentations was really wonderful. Uh, you know, the data is, and Jordan talked about it earlier, is as students graduate and become residents, uh, they have a different set of pressures put upon them. And then they go out into practice or work in various hospitals. And money becomes a huge issue that we somewhat um, spared about it in academic medicine, but it's not reality in terms of how most of the profession practices. Uh, and that, to me, is just an enormous challenge, as you point out, because uh, while fee-for-service medicine has its advantages, it also has a tremendous impact on just decisions one makes uh, and how one views uh, time and opportunity with patients and what's important. And it does seem to me to change what we're doing culturally 
uh, without changing that system is probably uh, probably just a pipe dream. And uh, if the reimbursement system, which should still re reimburse physicians and uh, for the quality of what they do and the training and all the time they do, but when it changes so it's not such a episodic payment for single activities, I think we have a much better chance of changing the culture of how medicine is practiced. And that may come. So uh, we should be optimistic as always, uh, realistic but optimistic about you know, what could happen to the profession in the next 10 years. And all of those of you who present will be the beneficiaries of that and hopefully have just a wonderful time. Go last. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I want to say uh, um, something about how we engage patients in the work that we do. Because, you know, there's a, a lot of um, message out there, uh, nothing about me without me. Um, because I think in this growing technologic time where you can do everything getting your own information, getting your charts. Um, not all patients, but a lot of patients, a growing number of patients, and the more and more people uh, are becoming technologically sophisticated, I think the more patients will want to be engaged in all the kind of kinds of conversations we're having right now in the room. And the more we kind of move into an era of transparency and engaging patients, in those conversations, I think that will make the quality of care that we provide for them better because patients view things differently than we do and their voices in the room can make us do a better job um, and not assume what they think but hear what they think. So I think one thing to think about when you do research like this, which I think has just been terrific, is maybe have some patients on your research team or your education team right from the beginning of your work and, you know, see what that experiment with that. Because I think uh, the nothing without me, about me, without me, will be a louder and louder theme for us as we move into the next phase of our culture. So you might play with that um, over the next couple of years. I'm an old woman, but anyways. So I have one comment that's lighthearted and one that's a little bit more serious. The lighthearted comment is, I have been scolding you for years to do more with psychiatry. But what did I hear today? I heard about being attuned to the ex inner experience of the patient. I heard about behavior. I heard about you know, really adept communication, which I'm sorry, is it at least got some overlap with psychiatry. So I'm going to let you off the hook. You're doing good. <laughs> the more serious comment is, um, you've got one life. And this is how you're spending it. And I was especially taken as I was listening to the presentations by the students of how you're choosing to dedicate your life, dedicating your work to the profession of medicine, um, dedicating your um, concerns to the well-being of patients, patients' families, the underserved, the marginalized, the stigmatized. And so I'm just extraordinarily impressed and inspired. And if there's one thing I would say as we go through uh, the years of our career, and Arthur, I think you were alluding to this, is hold that close and never let go of the inspiration, the meaning that that has for you now. I think it will be a great um, guiding focus, a compass throughout your entire career. All of us who are physicians remember a couple of patients in medical school that changed our lives. Um, many of us have done research projects funded many millions of dollars, funded by NIH others, inspired by one patient on one day where we just heard them in a different way. We understood the meaning of their experience in a different way and how the system related to it, how their, their life story related to something that had major impact and how others could learn from that in a medical system. So I just encourage you to be self-observing, to hold that uh, dear, never let go, use it as a compass throughout your career. And those of us who are a little, little longer in the tooth to get through the age uh, concept, to spend a little time thinking about those very patients who led us to this room at this moment and the difference that's made the privilege we've had in knowing those individuals. So. Uh, 
um, the, the winners of the third annual Pritzker Poetry Contest. Um, do, do we have those people in the room? Yes. Dr. Rama Yeager, who helped establish this contest, had intended to be here, but unfortunately um, has not arrived, so I'll sit in for him and do the introduction on the concept of the contest and also introduce a uh, poetry contest was established in 2012 by um, students Becky Levine and Margaret Nolan um, and supported financially by uh, Dr. Rama Yeager and his practice University Retina and Macula Associates created this contest to celebrate and inspire humanism and medicine through the arts and specifically through poetry. This is our third uh, annual contest. Um, there has been broad participation from across our medical center each year. There were over 100 individuals participating this year from areas of the medical center, including nursing, environmental services, uh, the residencies, our medical students, research assistants, and of course, our faculty. There are two categories um, of poetry in this contest, free form and six word and a winner and a runner-up um, is selected each year from each of those categories. There is a monetary prize attached to each of these, uh, these uh, winners and runner-up positions, $1,000 for winner and $250 uh, for runner-up. Um, this year's uh, winners and runners-up um, will, uh, will have their poetry read here today. Unfortunately, we don't have all four of our winners and runners-up. And so, um, but we are lucky to have one winner from each of the categories who will read both poems from each of those categories. So uh, we'll start uh, now with uh, the freeform winner, um, Alex Garnett, who's one of our third year um, students. And uh, she'll be reading her poem entitled, A Name. I ask her for her full name and the year that she was born. I ask her where she lives and who resides at home. I ask about her current health of aching joints and belly pains. I ask about her diet and the food that fuels her veins. I ask of juvenile ailments, though she struggles to recall. I ask about her parents' death, at what age and how. I ask of sordid details from a youth gone past times long ago forgotten, buried and forgiven by most, but not us. I ask her of her travels, her employment, and her sleep. And bit by bit, she offers up these pieces of her life because a body's secrets are no longer hers to keep. Now portions of a record scribed by a stranger's pen. I smile politely and turn to leave our encounter at its end. But at the door, I take pause as something in me stirs. I catch her eye and offer up one brief beholden look, for it seems strange that in exchange for everything I took, the only thing I've shared with her is a name she'd not quite heard. Um, Alex will now read um, the poem uh, written by Wei Wei Li, one of our general medicine physicians uh, working here in the primary care group um, that took second place in this category. Thank you, Alex. The name of the poem is This Is Just To Say. This is just to say, I have felt the thrill that flutters in your chest and which you were probably hoping was just nerves. Forgive me, my voice trembles, unsteady as I start to speak. That poem was based on uh, the William Carlos Williams poem of the same title. This is just to say that some of you may have recognized. So we're moving on now to our six word category. Um, and. Um, Maybe we'll start with our runner-up, um, Mark Robinson, who is here with us today to read um, his poem uh, entitled Solace. Uh, Solace. 
Um, so this is based on a, a, an ICU moment. So snow began to fall as a patient passed in the ICU, and it provided the wife of the patient a, just a beautiful moment um, for her and, and helped her through her time. So solace. Falling snow blankets her heart's ruins. Thanks, Mark. And then Mark will help us uh, read the poem that was the winner in this category, uh, Dropped Beats by Jasmine Downing. A pediatric resident observes the mourning parents of an infant with a congenital heart defect. Dropped beats. A broken heart divided leaves two. So um, actually, Rama has arrived. Rama, would you like to come up and make a few comments? While Rama is coming up, I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to thank um, him for so generously supporting this uh, poetry contest over the past few years. And I wanted to give you a few minutes just to make a few comments. Oh, sure. Well, thank you, uh, Jim. And uh, thanks to the entire uh, institution. What a uh, privilege it has been to uh, start the uh, poetry contest. And uh, I'm so proud of uh, Alex and Mark and the, the other winners for uh, doing such a great job. Um, I remember starting this with um, with some friends. I called Holly up, and she was so uh, supportive of the entire process. So I'm just really grateful that we uh, have had a chance to, to come here. And it's my privilege to support you guys, and uh, I'm really proud of you. Thank you very much. So in closing, just on behalf of the medical school and, and uh, Holly as well, I just wanted to thank you, but also um, all of our participants, those that uh, – um, took awards in the contest, but also those that participated um, in good faith in, in this uh, contest. Um, we also want to thank the staff who helped us navigate this contest. Each year it's, it's a, a, a fair amount of work putting together um, the invitations to participate and uh, uh, pursuing the judging, and of course the, the judges. But uh, most of all, Rama, I'd like to thank you for financially supporting this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for coming to this third uh, Buxbaum Institute annual donor symposium. Um, I want to thank the board very much, uh, Dr. Rubenstein and Dr. Roberts and Dr. Cohn, uh, as our outside members of the board. I see some of the other students in the program in the back. Thank, thank you all for coming. I know how busy you are. Uh, and. Um, tell you that uh, we hope to do this program uh, next year around the same day, uh, kind of the last Friday in April. And uh, uh, maybe you'll all join me in thanking our participants and our presenters.